You ever have certain expectations, um, expectations of what you think your day is going to look like and it didn't go that way? Expectations in relationships that didn't go that way? Expectations for repair work, okay? I don't know about you guys. You know, I always have ideas of how things are going to get repaired in my house, especially if I'm going to be doing it. And they never, ever go according to my plan because I'm not good at repairing things, okay? I have a feeling my family knows exactly what to expect in those situations, but I never seem to figure it out. I got some um, Father's Day cards that the children's ministry had made, my kids made for me. And, you know, it's all about, it says all about dad, right? And so I have an expectation. I'm going to read the question and I'm going to get some good answers. My kids know me and, and, and they're going to get, I mean, they're going to be spot on with these answers, right? So Eden, I got hers first. One of the things that struck me about her um, Father's Day card was that it says, my dad is four years old. <laughs> my dad has green hair. My dad's job is a Barbie player. <laughs> my dad laughs when he sees bunnies. These are my two favorite. My dad gets mad at my mom when I'm in her bed. My dad always says, don't ever say bad things. My dad loves me because he loves me. Very insightful. Zion, Zion got the age right. He was a little bit more on point. My hair is blonde for Zion. Uh, my dad calls me whatever he wants. Um, I love my dad because of everything. It's a good one. Judah, my dad always says, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> oh. That was, he was on point for a lot of stuff. He got everything right, pretty much. Um, Levi, my... Uh, my dad likes to wear superhero shirts. My dad laughs when he farts. <laughs> My dad gets mad when we misbehave. My dad calls me baby. Now, I have to explain. So if he does something and suck it up buttercup doesn't work, then it's, hey, don't be such a, a baby. So that's his thing is my dad calls me baby. All right. Um, I love my dad because he provides for us. My dad loves me because I'm his son. Man, you know, not always what you expect, but one thing I've learned is that when it comes to the Lord and his working in our life, even if it's not what we expect, it is most certainly and always good. God says that his ways are good, that his ways are not like our ways, that he has a plan for our lives and a future for our lives. He, he has hope for us, that all things do work together for good to those that love God. Have you ever watched one of those magic shows? You ever Remember like when they used to have like the David Copperfield specials and stuff like that? Young people are like, I have no idea who that guy is. It's like, what's that other dude that's cre crazy and creepy? Chris Angel, maybe more like him, but for less weird, you know? Um, I remember all those magic shows. I used to love watching them when I was a kid. And then... I think it was in my late teen years, they came out with this special called Revealing, you know, the Magic Tricks. And I remember watching this and I'm thinking like, oh man, these are going to be so amazing, so complex, you know, some of these tricks. And like some of the tricks where the guys levitate, they're just basically standing up on one foot, you know, and raising up another one. I'm like, that's it. That's, I was, I was blindsided by that, right? It wasn't what you were expecting. So too, I remember early on in my Christian faith hearing promises of all the things that God was going to do and all the ways that God was going to work and, and God was going to provide money and God was going to provide a family and God was going to provide everything that I ever wanted and all the foods that I ever desired and everything that my flesh desired. I mean, God was like a, 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 a slot machine that just never, never failed. You know what I mean? You pull the handle and then God just coughs it out for you, right? So too, I remember promises of the, the mystical side of, of who God was. You know, a lot of times we look at God and we consider him to be this great mystical being, right? 
Now, I want to encourage everybody here this morning that I believe that the Christian faith is not mystical. It is spiritual, but it is not mystical. See, because mysticism has in its core, if you will, the idea that it is unknowable except by unknowable ways and means that you have to discover for yourself. In other words, if you want to have a relationship with God, well, you better start figuring it out. You know, burn some incense, maybe light some candles, maybe jump through some spiritual hoops, perform some spiritual deeds. You need rites, you need gurus, you need people that are going to lead you in these ways. That is what mysticism teaches, and that's the exact opposite of what John is writing to us in his epistle, okay? He doesn't want people to sign up, so to speak, for this Christianity with expectations of what it was going to be required of them in order to draw closer to God. He wanted them to understand from the very beginning that God was both very accessible, okay, and also very practical. Okay, there is a supernatural side to who God is, right? The Bible says that the Father, He is a spirit, right? And there is a supernatural side to the way that God works, but it is not such a mystery that we have to, within our flesh, try to figure out how it is we're going to acquire this relationship with the Lord, right? Let me give you an area of Scripture to consider. In Colossians 1, 26 and 27, it says this, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, God is saying, hey, listen, we have lifted off that veil, that mystery of who God is, right? And who God is is found in the person of Christ. And how you draw closer to the Lord is found in the person of Christ. It's not through rites. It's not through rituals. It's not through spiritual acts, okay? It's not through penance. It's not through payment. It's not through any other means other than the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a quote-unquote spiritual person, then the answer for you is found in the person of Christ, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I know for some that's like, well, that's Christianity 101. That seems kind of trivial, Pastor Ryan. I, I think we already understood that. The problem is for us, you know what we start off doing? We start off with that idea, right? That all you need is Jesus. And then over time, we begin to adopt the idea that all you need is Jesus plus some other stuff. All I need is Jesus plus some really good books. All I need is Jesus plus a really good pastor. All I need is Jesus and a really good church. All I need is Jesus and some really good... And you go on. I, I need Jesus and to perform some rituals, some deeds, some things that will make him more happy with me. Right? And that's contrary to what God is showing us in his word. In fact, it was a group of people known as the Gnostics who John was specifically writing about at that time. The idea that there is hidden spiritual wisdom. That you can acquire the same relationship that I have with Jesus as anybody else could. That's what the Gnostics taught. You had to do certain things. You had to be a certain person in order to have a really good relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've ever looked at anybody in your life, in your Christianity, I know I have. And you said, man, they really got it together. They're really walking with the Lord. I wish I could have that kind of relationship with the Lord. Good news. You can. Well, what do I have to do? Just follow Jesus. In fact, you can have your own incredible and personal relationship with God. And again, I understand that that seems trivial, but what happens is for so many of us is we make something so simple, so complex. We take a biblical faith, and that's what we're going to be focusing on here this morning, a biblical faith, and turn it into a mystical faith. We take something that should be so practical and so easy that anybody could do it, and we make it so difficult and so tough, right? It's like me messing around with Transformers. I do not, I have a rule in my house. We do not have Transformers in my house, okay? I hate Transformers. Love the movie, you know, watch the show or something like that, cartoons when I was a kid. Great. Assembling a Transformer, I think the devil himself made those toys, all right? Just put them things together. It's such a, and it'll even say to insult me, all right? It even says on the box, you know, for ages 6 to 11, and it's like, what does that mean, all right? I can't put it together, all right? I don't understand how it works. It's so complex and intricate. But Christianity isn't that way. Biblical faith isn't that way. 
And if we, want to receive, or if we want to see the results of biblical faith in our life, then let's look at this area of Scripture now. It's in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. I'm sorry, verse, chapter 4, verse 20. Let's look at what he says biblical faith looks like. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. If you're, uh, if you're into the original language here, that word for liar is liar. All right? In other words, you don't have to really dig deep into this one. All right? If you say you love God and you hate his children, he says, you're not telling the truth. All right? He's saying, liar, liar, pants on fire. Whatever, however you want to put it down in your notes, I encourage you to do so. But understand that what God is saying here is it is impossible. It is contrary. You cannot say that you love God and you hate his children. He goes on, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. Let me get your attention, if you're taking note, one of the evidences, if you will, of having a biblical faith is having a passion for God's people. Having a passion for God's people. Guys, my personal pet peeves, I, you know I have several of them, but one in particular that I'm happy to share with you here this morning, I generally dislike when people put down, especially Christians, put down the church. Okay, It's not cool, it's not hip. I don't care how many videos there are of it online. I've seen videos of young guys giving these little raps or little poems about, you know, why God loves, it, loves Christians but hates the church. And it's like, dude, that's not cool. God doesn't hate the church. In fact, he says that's his bride. So to co convey an idea that somehow God hates his church, yes, it's filled with, with people with all sorts of issues, including yourself, right? But God doesn't hate his church, and we shouldn't hate his church either. We should love the brethren. We should love the sister. Now, that doesn't mean, understand this, that doesn't mean that we don't point out when there's heresy or that we don't convey that there are standards for being a member, if you will, of God's body, of God's, uh, of God's bride, right? God does have standards. God does say that this is what my people will look like, and this is how you can tell a true sheep and a wolf in sheep's clothing. All those things are conveyed. But listen, God does not at any time hate his children or hate his bride, if you will. He does not hate his church. And therefore, if we say at any point, guys, understand this, if we say we love God, but we hate his kids, we're being a liar in that moment. Why? Because understand this, imagine you come to me, you say, Pastor Ryan, I like you. You're a great guy. You're awesome. We should get together sometime. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. When do you want to do that? Well, when are you not going to be around your kids? I don't know when I'm not going to be around my kids. I mean, is it a problem? You know, I don't like your kids, especially Zion. I don't know what it is about him, but... I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think we can be friends. I don't, think, I don't think we're going to have a good relationship together, right? And so understand what God's saying to us as his children. He says, listen, there's a problem when you say you love me, but you hate them and you act like you hate them and you treat them like you hate them because that's supposed to be your family. It's crazy. It's like we don't understand the concept of eternity, right? It's forever. That means you're going to be around that person that you hate forever, right? Eternity. Right? You might want to rethink what destination you want to go to if you really don't want to be around those people that much. Like, that's our family. That's who we're going to be with forever. And he goes, and furthermore, he says, how can you hate somebody who is begotten by God just like you were? Just like you were. We forget just how sinful we are, right? right? We think that salvation didn't apply to us like it applied to them right? That somehow they need a lot more of God's grace and a lot more of God's mercy, right? And we just needed a little bit of it, right? We were maybe going to make it to heaven on our own some way, somehow, right? But God says, no, 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 listen, they're begotten just like you were begotten. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35 says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you're my disciples if you have love 
for one another. Now, I love this area of Scripture because it, it, for me, okay, it lets me know that I can't love people the way I want to love them. Why? Because what does God say? Hey, listen, I want you to love one another the way I loved you. Because if it was up to me, I would love them just in my own way, right? It's like, listen, I'll love them from afar, God. I'll love them without having any interaction with them, God. I'll love them, you know, with a bit of sarcasm mixed in. I'll love them with a bit of angst mixed in. I'll love them, you know, I'll love them, but I won't like them. Have you ever heard a Christian say that before? I'll love them, but I don't have to like them. Really, how does that work? How does that work for you? Right? Go, go tell that to your spouse. Go tell that to your children. Go tell that to your, your parents. I love you, but I don't like you at all. Really? That, I don't think that goes hand in hand right? Or, or better yet, listen, I'll, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. Really? How does that work? Because when God talks about forgiveness, he says that it's as far as the east is from the west. I mean, there's no remembrance. He holds no accounting of your sin. Well, God forgets. Wow. So God tells us that we're to love if we're to have a biblical faith, not just a mystical faith, but a biblical faith grounded in his word, that we're to love the way that he loves you know, it's interesting that history teaches us there are four main crusades, okay? You guys are familiar with his, you history buffs out there. There are four main crusades, okay? The fourth crusade, the reason why it's believed to have been lost, okay, by the Europeans was for one very important reason. They started attacking each other. In fact, it was during the fourth crusade that the city of Constantinople actually fell by the crusaders. In other words, the Christian crusaders attacked their own Christian city and started looting and plundering their own cities. You know what's interesting to me? People complain, especially in our country right now, that Christianity is on the decline, Pastor Ron. You know Christianity is on the decline. Yeah, I've heard that Christianity is on the decline. Yeah, you know, it's not good. In fact, we need to invite some more people. So you know how we invite more people? We start talking to people. And when we start talking to people, we say, hey, listen, you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, you should come to our church. Well, I go to my own church. Your church stinks. You should come to my church. Right? We don't ever do something like that. It's easier to invite Christians who are already going to a church because we don't want to have that awkward conversation with people that don't know Jesus because, well, if we invite people that aren't Christians to church, well, they might feel uncomfortable. Well, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Right? We're hoping that we invite the unbelievers. Why is it? Let me, you guys who are on social media, isn't it an amazing thing that you're constantly targeted by Christian advertisements for churches? Why do you think they do that? Because they look up your searches and they go, well, we want to invite the people who are interested in these things already. Not the people who aren't interested in these things. But what's happening is Christianity is declining because we've stopped going out into the world to the people who don't know Jesus Christ. And it's a lot easier to just have conversations with people who are supposedly interested in the Lord or interested in the things of the Lord and inviting them. And we're constantly infighting with one another rather than outreaching to the world. A passion for God's people, a passion for God's children, means going out to even the lost of the lost, the most wicked, the ones who are going to curse you and tell you to go away, that they're not interested. You know, it's interesting. When I say to my kids, when they're fighting with each other, sometimes even from across the house, get along, stop arguing with one another. Right? You guys ever heard that before or said that before? Get along, stop arguing with each other. Their willingness to obey or to disobey that commandment is not a reflection of what they think of each other, but what they think of me. What they think of me. You go, how so, Pastor Ryan? Well, see, if they respect me, and if they're willing to listen to what what I'm telling them to do, if they treasure my commands, if you will, then you know what they're going to do? They're going to go, you know what? For the love that I have for the Father, even if I'm mad at my sibling, I'm going to obey. And God says, listen, if you love me, You're going to love them even when it's not easy to love them because it's me that you love because I'm the one that's your motivation. I'm the one that's going to be your inspiration. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 44 says this, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Man, love the person that loves me. Pray for those who pray for me. 
right? Bless those who have blessed me, right? Isn't that what he says? No. Love those who don't love you. Bless those who won't bless you. And those that spitefully use you, man, pray for them. Pray for their salvation. Pray that their hearts would be changed and transformed. You know, it's interesting. When we, for, when we moved to this building, not, not couple, many years ago, actually, when we moved back to this building, I should say, we uh, had some other tenants that shortly, that came after us, okay? It was another church, all right? You guys, some of you guys were here for this. You remember that. They were upstairs, and we had to have all these meetings. It was our church downstairs, the other church upstairs, and we had to have all these meetings to coincide time so that when we're playing worship, we're not interrupting their service. When they're playing worship, they're not interrupting our service. When we're doing messages, the idea was to keep the noise levels the same, and we had to make sure that certain parts of the building were separated. And what was, what was really interesting to me, I, I know Andrew was with me for some of these meetings that we had to have where we sat down and went over these details. One of the things that the pastor at the time was a big, big stickler on is he says, listen, he says, I do not want your people, because we had greeters at the time, we still do, I do not want your people to say hello, to greet our people, to invite them to your church. I said, well, I can't promise that they're not going to say hello, but I will promise that if they say they're going to your church, we're not going to sit there and go, hey, no, you should check out our church. Promise, promise to do this, right? So that was the agreement that was made, and that was what we followed through on. It was a couple weeks afterwards, after they had started, that that they weren't really adhering to the agreements that we had made. But what was very interesting is in one service in particular, my mom came to me. My mom says, Ryan, Ryan, the, the pastor over there, he keeps telling me that I need to leave your church and go up to his church. I said, really? He goes, yeah, yeah. She keeps, he keeps, I don't know why. I don't know why. I said, don't even worry about it. Just, you know, if you want to go to their church, mom, you can, but, you know. Might be a little awkward. Might be an awkward dinner tonight, but whatever. Don't worry about it. It was interesting to me because when I had went to him, I said, hey, listen, I know you wanted me to be a stickler on this thing. You know, I just wanted, I, you were inviting my mom to church multiple times. No, 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 my people never invited. No, no, you're misunderstanding. You went up to my mom and invited her to your church. And listen, I don't even care, brother. I don't even care. And, and, and it was one of those moments where you're like, you know what, I'm just going to love those. We're being unlovable at the moment. I'm going to love those who are being dishonest at the moment. Guys, listen, person to person here, we deal with a lot of people who don't deserve love on a regular basis. We deal with a lot of people that are dishonest and hurtful, that, that do us wrong. But understand this, that the message is best manifested, if you will, when that which we say, the material that we use, is demonstrated in our lives. It's not enough to simply look at people and say, as Christians, we're supposed to love the unlovable. We're supposed to bless those who hurt us. No, no, no. What the world wants to see is, okay, you show me. You show me how you're going to love the unlovable. You show me how you're going to bless those who hurt you. That is a true demonstration of biblical faith. That means that you actually believe what God's word says and aren't just reciting it and regurgitating it. You've heard these verses before. Most of you Christians that have been se- that are seasoned saints or been se- been Christians for a couple years now, you've probably already heard these verses. You've probably already heard these verses before. Hey, you're supposed to love the un- you're supposed to love those who hurt you. You're supposed to love the brethren, right? This is nothing new. But what John is saying is for those that truly adhere to God's word, that have a biblical faith, not just a mystical faith. Not just a, just a, an over-spiritualized faith, but a practical faith. Something that can be tangible. This is going to be manifested in their life. 2 Samuel 16, verse 5. Going to verse 14, it says this. Now when King David came to Baharum, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. Now, in case you're wondering, the servants that it's talking about here are not just like some humble, like meek, you know, ragged, you know, servants, slaves or anything like that. These were basically people in the military. 
This was David and his military. These were the mighty men of David following David as he's being kicked out of his own city, right? And there's this one guy, one guy who thought he had the advantage because there was a great gap between them that's throwing rocks and cursing David from afar. All right, now you're King David. Now, yeah, you've been deposed of your throne temporarily by your son, but listen, it's not to be forgotten that this is the guy that took out Goliath, right? It's not to be forgotten that these are the men who fought against the other Philistines. These were mighty men of valor, the Bible says. And there this one guy is throwing rocks and cursing King David, right? And if it was me, I would have been it. And I was just like, somebody shoot an arrow through that guy's head over there, all right? Be done with this fool, all right? But it goes on. It says, And all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left, he's, he's, there's every, guys everywhere at this point is what it's telling us, right? Also Shimei said thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. All right, now, now for me, I'm maybe keeping cool, right? Like at the beginning, he throws some rocks, whatever. Just Now he's saying, come on, come on, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, tough guy? Come on, let's fight, let's get... Right? That, that, for me, that's enough. It's like, well, he's asking for it. I, I might as well, you know? It's what he wants, Lord. I'm trying to serve my brother here. He's asked for it. You bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. That's that. That's that for me right? Now you're going to bring my family into it. Now you're going to bring up that touchy subject, which I told you about, and I told you not to mention it before. I can't believe, you ever had somebody that you confided in, that you shared something with, and then they went ahead and they took that information, they used it against you for their gain? It's like, man, listen, we were cool, but now you crossed the line, right? So what's David's response? So now we are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king. Now Abishai, by the way, in case you're wondering, is one of Joab's brothers, okay? This is, this is a mighty, this is a head general, if you will, okay? And Abishai was one of those guys, man, that he, he, he fought hard, okay? He fought hard for his king, all right? He wasn't afraid of anybody. He took out giants himself, it records for us in 2 Samuel. He wasn't afraid of nobody, all right? At this point, David's not doing something, so Abishai says to him, why should this dead dog, this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please, let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, what have I to do with you, the son, you sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, See how my son, who came from my own body, seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be the Lord will look on my affliction, and the Lord will repay me with good for this cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed. As he went, he threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king, watch this, now the king and all the people were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. What does that mean? It means that as you are going through this difficult season, just like David and his men are being cursed, having the, the, the attacks of the enemies flung your way, the fiery darts of the enemy constantly bombarding you, okay? Rather than reacting in the flesh, David responded in the spirit, recognizing that God is sovereign over all things and over all people. And those people who may be a burden to us at the time are still God's people, and he still believed that God was still sovereign over all his people. And he says in that knowledge, in that place, where Shimei, who did not stop, with the kicking of the dust and the throwing of the stones and the cursing, you know what happened? They were refreshed there when they were weary. It's an amazing thing. Sometimes we fight so hard to get away from certain people and to get away from certain elements, and it's those very people and those very elements that God says, and listen, I'm keeping you here until you're going to allow yourself to be refreshed by me there so that you can minister to those people effectively. It's an amazing thing. 
And sometimes I'm like, God, can you please, never at this church, maybe at other churches, God, can you please move this brother or this sister along, right? Can you please take, can you deal with them, God? Can you wake them up? Can you do something? And God's like, no, 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 I just want you to rest there for a little bit. I want you to rest there. I want you to know that I'm still sovereign, and I'm sovereign over their life. And there's not a single person. The Bible says that God is not willing that none should perish. I want to be able to say that for myself. I don't know if I, if I honestly could say that. And it's probably because I don't have the same perspective that God does concerning eternity and hell. I once heard a pastor say that understanding hell, is, it, it, it's, it's not wishing it upon your worst enemy. To truly have a good understanding of hell, it's to not wish it upon your worst enemy to the vilest of all human beings if you really understand what hell is going to be like. It's like, oh Lord, you have a passion for your people. God, help me to have a passion for your people as well, to walk in a faith that is biblical and practical. Look with me now at verse 2. Back in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. One of the other things I think is evident in a biblical faith is a miraculous obedience. A miraculous obedience. It's not about being a people person, right? For some of us here, we think, you know what? God wants me to be a people person, but I struggle with being a people person, right? Some of you guys are introverts. Some of you guys are extroverts, okay? Everybody always assumes that the pastor is this extrovert, right? And it's like, oh, Pastor Ryan, you got so much to say up there. It's like, no, it's just a week's worth of stuff I've been writing down. Then you get down and you're like, you want this long conversation. I'm just like, I don't know what to say right now. I'll be honest with you. I'm struggling with it myself, right? No, no, no. God's not looking for people to be people persons per se. What he's looking for them to do is see the value of those people and understand this and to obey the commandments of God. Why we love people isn't because we just have this mystical love that we wake up with in the morning for all the people around us. That might not happen. Listen, that boss that you work for, you might not all of a sudden just start loving them. Like, oh, I just can't wait to go see that boss who yells at me, who calls me all those horrible names every single day. I can't wait to go see them. No, 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 it's not pretend. It's not mystical, right? But what it is, is it's obedience to his word. You know what, I'm going to go see that boss, and no matter what he says, no matter what she says to me, I'm just going to be praying for him. I'm just going to obey. I'm just going to love on them. I'm going to do whatever they ask me to do, even if they're mean to me and unfair to me. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it because it's God who I'm being obedient to. Understand this. You realize in Romans chapter 12 when it talks about submitting to governing authorities? Submitting to governing authorities, right? right? That's not like our government, okay? Sometimes you think like, oh, man, you know, so-and-so's in office. I don't know if I could, but that's not my president. That's not my president. You know what I mean? And, and, and I don't know if I could obey. I don't know if I could like this person. Understand, when they wrote, when God inspired through the Holy Spirit, these men to write, submit to governing authorities, you know who he's talking about? The Romans who were killing Christians, who did not like the Christians. The Jews in positions of authority inside the temple. He's saying, submit to them. Do you realize that Paul, this is an incredible story in the book of Acts. At one point, Paul says something in retaliation to one of the Pharisees, okay? It's basically like a sarcastic remark he gives back to one of the Pharisees, okay? Not knowing that it was the chief priest. And when somebody hits him and says, that's the chief priest you're talking to, do you know what he does? He apologizes. You go, wait a second, he was right. He was 100% right. And he was walking with God, and they weren't. You're 100% right. But he did not respect the governing authority and became convicted in his own heart as he realizes who he was speaking to. What? Submit under governing authorities? Man, obedience to God's word? It's a miracle. It requires a miracle. You know, I learned something. My son... We were driving in the car, and um, my wife had just done a great job cleaning out the van. She does this, you know, quite often because we have four children, and it requires a lot of cleaning, right? My son, we, she had just finished a big clean inside the van, and my son decides to make a big mess, Levi, right? 
And so my, my wife says to Levi, I says, Levi, why did you make such a big mess? And he responds to her, because it's my job to make the mess, and it's your job to clean the mess. <laughs> Son, I don't know if I could save you from this. <laughs> the wrath that you've incurred upon yourself. <laughs> Sometimes we think, like, God doesn't care if we go into situations or circumstances. Like, oh, I made a mess of it, but who cares anyways? You know, the grace of God covers that thing. Yeah, you're right. God's grace most certainly covers a multitude of our sins. But understand this, that the grace of God that he gives to us, right, it's not just for the covering of sins, but it's also for the transformation of our hearts. It's for the transformation of our minds. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you, Christian, this is for every one of you and me, okay, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, when they're looking on and they go, I don't know if I believe this Christianity. Oh, no? Then allow my life to prove to you the validity of what God is saying that his word is powerful and his word will transform. And that faith that I have is not just mystical, it's tangible. And you want to know how it's tangible? It's tangible because of the life that I live, because I'm obedient to his word no matter the cost. It solidifies the witness. You know what happens when we refuse obedience to God's word? Or 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, it's a dialogue between... King David, right, and Nathan the prophet. And it was right after David had slept with Bathsheba and right after he had killed her husband Uriah to cover up the fact that she was pregnant, right? And what does David do? What does David do? He, he, he just goes about life as normal. It's like, ah, oh, no big deal. I'm still a servant of God. I'm still a king, you know. Hey, nothing bad has happened, so it must be okay. No big deal. God's grace is there. And yeah, some people, I heard some murmuring in the kingdom. Some people know that I did this, but what? What's a big deal anyways, right? And Nathan the prophet comes, gives him this whole story about what's going, you know, what he had done, and, and sorry, I got distracted for a second, and, and, and gives him this picture of the, uh, of, of sheep, right? And this person that robs another man of his sheep, and kills the sheep, and, but there's this one very interesting line. He says, David, when David realizes what he did, he says, you gave the enemies of God an occasion to blaspheme. You gave them a reason to mock God. Man. You ever wonder why Christian scandals make the news? Guys, you ever wonder why Christian scandals make the news? Because they're watching. You don't think that they're watching, but they do. And isn't it an amazing thing that every single time well, a pastor falls or somebody does something that they're not supposed to do, isn't it an amazing thing that every single time that happens, it makes the news, it's in the newspaper, people are talking about it? I, listen, it doesn't matter that I'm not Catholic. Do you know how many Catholic jokes I get on a regular basis about priests doing things that they're not supposed to do? I get guys, I send out Bible verses, you guys get some of them, but I also send them out to unbelievers. And sometimes they respond with the newest scandal or this thing. Or that. It's like, man, they give the enemies of God an occasion to blaspheme. Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15.34, he says, Awake to righteousness. I know some of you guys are feeling a little sleepy right now. Let me hear you. Awake to righteousness. In other words, open up your eyes to the opportunity that God's giving you to be obedient to his word, awake to righteousness, and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. All right, that makes sense, Pastor Ryan. Uh, some don't know God, and I, and, and I need to awake to this opportunity to, to walk out this faith in a practical way, this biblical faith amongst them, right? But watch this, watch this. He says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak to your shame. I speak to your shame. What, what, what does that mean? He says, the reason why some people haven't come to know Christ is because the witness that you've presented to them has been unconvincing. You go, oh man, 
Pastor Ryan, this is not a good Father's Day message. You were supposed to do something light. You know, we might have some, some visitors for the first time. Like, you ain't supposed to be talking about this kind of stuff this way. Understand what John is saying here. He's saying, listen, the children of God behave in a certain way in the hopes that others around them might come to know Christ. And if they're not coming to know Christ, then one of the things that we have to evaluate as a church and as his children is are we loving them the way that God loves them? Are we being obedient to his word the way he's called us to be obedient to his word? And if we're not, rather than just going, well, I guess it's not the Holy Spirit's will. I guess, I guess it's not God's will that they be saved. He also says, maybe you should consider that the witness that you've had before them has not been good. And that's a hard one. Guys, I have family members that don't know Christ. My father, my mother. I mean, I, I have plenty of family members that don't know Christ. And one of the things that I've wrestled with, especially early on in my Christianity, I realized something. I was a terrible witness. I was a terrible witness. I was unkind. I was kind of rude. You know, even so this day, I still struggle with that sometimes. But, you know, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Man, and realizing that, you know what, Lord, maybe there needs to be something that changes in my obedience and my willingness to honor you before them. If I really want to see them come to know Christ, maybe i got to love them the way that you love me. Maybe i got to witness to them and pursue them the way that you pursued me. Maybe i got to consider the example that you gave to me by how you lived your life. Right? The Bible says that we're to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Ambassadors. We are to speak on behalf of our King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to the lost. And he goes, man, you ought to consider the weight, if you will, of that position. Note with me verse 3. He says, it's not burdensome. I don't know, Pastor Ryan, it sounds pretty burdensome to me. I mean, the, what, you're, what you're asking me to do here, how you're asking me to live, it sounds a little tough. You know what I realized this week? Everybody thought that while my wife and kids were away, that I was just going to be living it up. Like, oh, I got nothing to do. It's simple. It's easy. There's no, no chores to do around the house. You know what I realized? Man, it is hard. Some of y'all came out and helped me. It was so hard, and I appreciate that. All right? I, I got home, I would start my morning off early in the morning. I'm doing the dogs, taking out the dogs, feeding the dogs. All my kids used to do this, right? Uh, I'm cleaning up my, the best of my ability around the house, trying to wash dishes, take out the trash. I mean, I'm going insane. Then I have to go to work. Then I come home from work. Then I got to make a meal. I, don't, I haven't done that since college, all right? And then I realized something too, like what I could consume in college, it, I can't consume that stuff anymore. I ate a frozen pizza one night, and I thought I was going to die. Like, I was like, like, oh, this is not good for me anymore, right? I, like, resorted to salad. Yeah, that's just your best bet, all right? It's not as easy as people think it is. And God understands that. What he's called us to do, the, the holiness, the standard of holiness and righteousness he's called us to do, is not easy on our own or in the flesh, but remember, as we even talked about last week, that he has given us help. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us the church. He's given us his word that we might be able to follow in this standard, that we might be able to follow him. Look with me, finally, at verse 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're taking note, one of the final evidences, if you will, of a biblical faith is an unshakable faith and hope. It was in 2007 that the New York Giants won the Super Bowl. The New York Giants won the Super Bowl. They were on it other times as well. But this year in particular was quite memorable because they beat the unbeaten at that time New England Patriots, okay? And anytime the Patriots lose, that's a, that's a day of celebration in and of itself. But this was memorable because these guys weren't supposed to lose, right? Up until that point, they were 18-0. They hadn't lost a single game, and the Giants had lost plenty of games at that point, right? And it was amazing things that this team 
was unscathed. They were, un, they were unhindered by the, the record, if you will, of this unbeaten team. It didn't faze them. God says to his children, despite the conditions of the world around you, despite the difficulties that you face. Remember we talked about this last week? I, I lift up my eyes to the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. When you're looking at this in, un, insurmountable mountain, if you will, and you think to yourself, there is no way that I can climb this. There's no way that I can do this. Note this, that if you have a biblical faith, and you're looking to the Lord for help, and you're trusting in His Word and in His sovereignty, it doesn't matter how big the obstacle is, because our God is that much bigger. The Bible says that those, those who are in Christ Jesus, have overcome the world. In fact, in John 16, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right? He doesn't say, don't worry. He doesn't say, relax. What is Jesus' instruction here in the midst of great difficulty? Be of good cheer. Laugh about it. Smile. Think to yourself, as we talked about even at the beginning of the service here today, guys, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to be glad and rejoice in it. What's there to worry about? What's there to freak out about? Did God get off the throne? Did somebody depose God of his, of his authority? Did somebody beat God that we don't know about? When the Bible references the Lord in heaven, it references him in two ways, standing or seating, never pacing back and forth, never worried about what was going on around the world. We should be the same. In fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11, it tells us that the, the believers have overcome all things by the blood of the Lamb and the word of His testimony. And in Revelation 3.21, it says that the overcomers, the same people we're reading about here in 1 John, are seated with the Father. You're going to be sitting down. You should be sitting down. You should be relaxed. Pastor Ryan, you have no idea of the circumstances that I'm facing. You have no idea of the sin and the bondage that I'm facing. It's interesting to note that term, be of good cheer, that we just read about, it occurs also in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. It's when Jesus heals the paralytic and he says, be of good cheer. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, he uses the term again when he's healing the woman of the issue of blood. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 27, he uses the phrase again when he's walking on the water in the midst of the storm and the disciples are freaking out. He says, be of good cheer. And finally, in Mark chapter 10, verse 19, when he heals the blind man, be of good cheer. Biblical faith is not a mystery. It's something that every single one of us could possess if we possess a relationship with Jesus Christ. An unshakable faith. Man, you really want to win the lost? Show them that you're unshakable. Not because of your own strength, because of the foundation in which you have built upon. The reason why our faith is to be unshakable is because our foundation is in the person of Jesus Christ and it's in his word. Even when the world changes around us and our circumstances change around us, God, the Bible says, changes not. He doesn't change. He doesn't freak out all of a sudden. And you know what's amazing in all of this is we talked about this biblical faith, guys. The power that it possesses. You see, sometimes, it, if I'm being honest with you, one of my biggest struggles is you ever come across an area of Scripture? You ever, come a, you ever got in rhema word? You know, like the Lord speaking right to you, and you're like, all right, Lord, I'm ready to apply that to my life. That is good, sound counsel, right? I'm going to apply that principle to my life right now. And I'm going to trust, God, that you're going to show up in an amazing way because you do, and your word promises that you will. So I'm going to start doing it. Right? I'm not going to walk in fear anymore, at least for a solid week. And we start doing it, and then the circumstances of life cause us to forget about the promise that we made, the commitment that we made to the Lord, and we're right back into that situation again. Oftentimes, the principles and the blessings of walking in those principles will not manifest themselves for some time to come. And often, as we talked about at the beginning of the message here, they don't manifest themselves in the way that we expected them to. I was talking to you guys last week about a missionary, and I was talking to this missionary, his name is Paul Kelly. he's in, in Kenya. I was commending him for his great faith. I mean, I'm like, dude, you, 
you're a tough dude. You're out in Kenya, in the slums of Kenya. You're ministering to people, raising up pastors and ministers. And he says to me, oh, no, man. He says, no, no, no. It's the missionaries in the Muslim countries. Those guys, their faith is incredible. I said, what do you mean? He says, I have a friend of mine who was in Chad for 12 years. The country of Chad is a Muslim country. He's there for 12 years. He does not see one person in his 12-year missions, missions time come to know Christ. Not one single person gives their, their life to Christ. And he's in this village. And while he's in this village, his son, his most precious son, okay, he's not like he has favorites, but he's like, man, this one is my firstborn. It's my, my, my boy. His son contracts malaria and dies. 12 years, not a single convert. His son contracts malaria and dies in Chad. And they're holding a funeral. They're holding a funeral in this, in this small village for his son. And it is at that funeral that the chief of that village asks Christ into his life and the entire village gets saved. Twelve years. For some of us who go, I've given it two weeks walking through this. And it's tough, Pastor Ryan. It might take a little bit longer. It might. Joseph, 30-something years. David, approximately 30 years. Right? The disciple, I mean, guys, three years walking with Christ. You know, we expect that God's going to show up how we want Him to show up at the very moment we ask Him to show up. And that's what faith is all about. That's not. Faith is walking with God even when it's most difficult to. It's trusting in the Lord's sovereignty. It's not a mystical thing. It's a practical thing and a real thing. And if we want to see our loved ones and we just want to see our community transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the testimony of His Word in our lives, it might take some time, right? That's why Paul says it's what? It's a marathon. It's a race, right? It ain't a sprint. You ain't going to get there by next week. But here's the beautiful thing about walking with the Lord. It says that He is the author of, and the finisher of our faith, that he who begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. Just wait on it. Just continue to wait. Trust the Lord that he is good.